Tonight, for the first time, we have the story of the rescue of Jessica Buchanan. It is the tale of a secret mission by SEAL Team 6 that few people have heard about until now. On a January night in 2012, members of SEAL Team 6 jumped from a plane into the skies of Somalia. Jessica Buchanan was being held hostage, and the SEALs were descending just in time. Buchanan was a humanitarian aid worker who had come to help children in one of the most dangerous places on earth. Hers was an ordeal that ended in a flash of violence, but had begun 93 days earlier when her car was stopped by bandits in a place she calls hell. The story will continue in a moment. We stopped very abruptly, like so abruptly that I felt like everybody just fall forward. And then I start hearing all of this pounding on the windows and the windshield and all this shouting in Somali. And there's a man standing there screaming and he has an AK-47 and he's shouting and he's pointing it at us. And then he climbs into the car next to me and he points an AK in my face. And they're hyped up like they're on speed. And all of a sudden we just take off. The driver just takes off and we just start slamming all over the place down these camel tracks. What did you think they were going to do? I figured they were going to rape me and then kill me. And I just keep thinking this can't be the end. This can't be the end of my life. I'm only 32 years old. I haven't had any children yet. I didn't get to say goodbye to Eric. I, I, I didn't get to say goodbye to my dad. Like, this can't be the end. Jessica Buchanan was facing the end at the end of the earth. Somalia, on the farthest tip of Africa, is war-torn and lawless. This is essentially no man's land. Militias battle over an unforgiving land, as we saw while covering a famine there in 2011. It was the same year that Buchanan was with a Danish charity teaching children how to avoid landmines. On October 25th, her car was hijacked. The driver is driving like just a madman. We're bouncing all over the place. My head keeps hitting the window. It keeps hitting the roof. I'm holding on to the, the side, uh, the handle on the Land Cruiser, just trying to keep myself steady. What happened next? It gets dark and we've changed vehicles a couple of times. More people have come, they're screaming. And I hear from behind me a higher pitched voice going on and on in Somali. And I think, my God, they have a woman involved in this. And I turn around and I see a small child in the back of the Land Cruiser with an AK-47 draped in ammunition and I think the irony <laughs> of, of why I came to Africa in the first place. Exactly the kid you were trying to save, a child soldier. Yeah. What was he doing? Learning the trade. She'd been kidnapped along with a co-worker Paul Thisted. They drove into the night and then were ordered to march into the desert. And they tell us to get down onto our knees. And I think, okay, this is it. Like, I'm bracing myself to be shot in the back of the head. And I think that there's mercy in the fact that maybe they're not going to rate me first, but that it's just going to be quick. And I'm waiting, and I'm waiting. And then all of a sudden, somebody shouts from behind us, sleep and I'm thinking oh my god I didn't hear that correctly did I he just said sleep she collapsed slept through the night and the next morning was met by the man who led the bandits and we ask him are you going to kill us is that why we're here he says no 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 money we just want money how much were they asking for they started out at $45 million. They thought you were pretty valuable. I guess so. The bandits used her cell phone to call her husband, Eric Landemom. 
The two had married on an African beach two years before. But his number and the numbers of Buchanan's family had all been disconnected. It was part of the charity's emergency plan. The one number that worked was her Nairobi office with a hostage negotiator standing by. And so began months of talks. Where did they keep you? Day in, day out. Under trees. Uh, outside. You were outdoors for 93 days? Mm-hmm. Yep. And in, in the night, they forced us to sleep out in the open. What were the nights like? Long and cold. Then the rainy season hit, and it would rain all night long, and you're already freezing, so then you're sitting there wet. What were you eating? Tuna fish. Maybe once a day, um, we would get a small can of tuna fish and a piece of bread. Did you feel like you were beginning to lose your humanity at any point? Yeah, I mean, they treated us like animals. To be so sick that, you know, you're vomiting behind bushes and you can't walk straight and you're laying in the fetal position on the ground under a tree and they don't even they don't care their duty was to keep me from dying because then I wasn't worth anything they were in the hands of men and boys who were chewing cot it's a plant with the same effect as amphetamines they were so hyped up um, on speed. It was like drinking pot after pot of coffee and then the crash would come and, and then it brought a lot of belligerence and, and a lot of uh, anger and a lot of temper. You and Paul came up with nicknames for a lot of the people who were keeping you. That's one of the ways you kept yourself occupied. We did. The ten-year-old boy? Crack baby. Because he was cracked out all the time. He was chewing cot, and he had two black holes for eyes. There was nothing inside. This is one of the camps where she was held. The bandits hit her, pointed their guns at her, and put a knife to her throat. But it was exposure that took a toll. She lost 25 pounds. After three weeks, the bandits made a video to prove that she was alive. Have you seen the video? I have. Paul and myself, Jessica, we are safe and we are alive. I can tell I'm starting to lose hope at that point. But hope would have to last for two more months. As the many weeks went by, did you think the American government's watching me, they know where I am, and somebody's going to get me out of here? No. Why? Because I'm just an aid worker. You didn't imagine that the President of the United States knew your name? Never. Never in a million years. After three months in the desert, Buchanan had a serious urinary tract infection. And in a final call to the hostage negotiator, she said this. I had become so ill that I couldn't stand up. I couldn't walk. So I was in so much pain. And I said, I think I have a kidney infection. And I started to cry and I said, I think I'm afraid I'm going to die out here. When that call was received here in Nairobi, it set off a chain of events that led all the way to the Oval Office. The FBI and the military consulted doctors who said that if Jessica had a kidney infection, she might have just two weeks to live. That was transmitted to the president, who was also informed that in just a few days, there would be a new moon, perfect darkness for a SEAL Team rescue. Jessica Buchanan had chosen a star in the Somali sky to represent her mother, who had passed away a year before. She spoke to it every night, and with no moon, it was especially bright on January 25th. What did you say that night? Please tell God that I need some help. We need to get out of here. You couldn't have known that that prayer would be answered that night. I had no idea. She was on a mat trying to sleep when she heard a faint scratching noise. One of the bandits she nicknamed Helper heard it too. And I see this look of just sheer terror on Helper's face. And then all of a sudden it's just this eruption of gunfire. 
And I think, okay, well, this is it. This really is truly the end. And I cover up with my blanket again, and I just start saying, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. And I just remember thinking, or maybe I'm saying out loud, like, I cannot survive this. She thought she was being taken by a rival group, maybe al-Shabaab, Islamic extremists who would surely kill her. And then all of a sudden, I feel all these hands on me, roughly grabbing at me. And I try to protect myself, and I pull the blanket closer on top of me, and then I hear my name. But it's not a Somali accent, it's an American accent. And I can't compute, like I can't understand that somebody with an American accent knows my name. And they say, Jessica, we're with the American military. We're here to take you home and you're safe. And they pull the blanket down from my face and all I see is black black masks, black sky, and all I can say over and over is you're American. You're American. I don't, I, I don't understand you're Americans. Thinking, how did you get here? And I, I'm still alive. And they ask me where my shoes are, and I don't know, and one of them picks me up and starts running. He runs for several minutes and and it puts me down on the ground and then they identify themselves and that they knew I was very sick and they have medicine and they have water they have food and they've come to to take me home at one point I think they thought they heard something or I don't know this group of men who's risked their life for me already, asks me to lie down on the ground because they're concerned that there might be somewhere, someone out there and then they make a circle around me and then they lie down on top of me to protect me. And we lay like that until the helicopters come in. When all of those seals laid down on top of you, you were the most important thing in the world to them. It's really hard to comprehend. They were going to take a bullet for you. Mm -hmm. And they're so kind, and they're so gentle, and they are trying to assist me to get to the helicopter. But I think I've been out here for months. I can run to this helicopter myself, and so I just break away, and I just take off running through the scrub, through the bush, and I throw myself onto that helicopter and push myself up against the wall. And I don't start breathing until we actually lift up off the ground. And they hand me an American flag that's folded. What did you think of that? I just started to cry. At that point in time, I have never in my life been so proud and so very happy to be an American. The SEALs left on other helicopters. She didn't see their faces, didn't hear their names. They appeared and they were gone. The only thing left in the camp were nine dead bandits. Mr. Speaker! It all ended just hours before the State of the Union address. As the president walked in, he had a secret with Defense Secretary Leon Panetta that almost no one understood until later. Good job tonight. Good job tonight. After the speech, President Obama called Buchanan's father. Jessica met her husband, Eric, at a U.S. base in Italy. I just couldn't believe he was standing there and that I was standing there. And we had a, we had a second chance. And then uh, later we flew to Portland, Oregon, and I was reunited with my father and my brother and my sister and her husband. What was the first thing you said to your father? Daddy. <laughs> And I'm just, I'm so sorry that you had to go through this. But 
but we made it. So did her Danish co-worker, Paul Fisted, who was also rescued by the SEALs. He said later that his lucky break was being captured with an American. Jessica Buchanan has told her story in a new book, Impossible Odds, coming out this week. You may recall that she said that her first thought when being taken was that she was too young to die because she hadn't had children. Well, she's taken care of that, too. She and her husband have a baby boy, and they've moved back to the States from East Africa.